Support for this program comes from Jazz on the Tube, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos. From Miles Davis to Louis Armstrong, from Thelonious Monk to Duke Ellington, you'll find it all on jazzonthetube.com. Start your free subscription today. Hi, and welcome to Jazz Talk, a Jazz on the Tube podcast. My name is Ken McCarthy, and this is where we talk with people who are doing important work that supports and illuminates the music we love. The writers, the scholars, the educators, the filmmakers, the producers, and more. And today, we're talking with Judy Carmichael. Judy, welcome. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. If I were to try to represent Judy in, a, in graphic form, I would, I would have to use one of those Hindu goddesses with eight arms. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I like that a lot. Thank no, you for true. that. It's true. She's an author. She's a producer. She runs the best jazz interview series on the planet, which we're going to talk about a little Aww, bit later. Thank you. It's really, it's really true. And she's a pianist. She's a lyricist. She's an educator. She's a promoter of the music. She's an elevator of the music. It's really, it's, I'm so glad to have you on this call, Judy. We have so much to talk about. I can almost predict that we're not going to have enough time, but that's, that's, <laughs> this is the first part of our interview. That'll be, okay, this is episode one. <laughs> good, good. That takes the pressure off because this is exactly, so Exactly, exactly. Thank you. First, I'd like you to tell a bio, part of your bio story, because I love it, and I think it is a, the epitome of the difference between somebody who makes it as an artist or in any field and somebody who maybe doesn't. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set you up, and you, you, you already know the story. Your grandfather offered his grandchildren <laughs> Offered me some. Well, but I just love how you set that up, though. I mean, even saying people who make it and don't, because I think, because people will ask me a lot, you know, what is the secret of, of making it in the arts and all of this, and they say, oh, you have to love it, and it, it's so far beyond loving it. It's mm -hmm. about I think you have to have a freakish level of energy and be in a freakish level, or a freakish, how do I want to put this, an unusually high tolerance for delayed gratification, mm -hmm. and just loads of energy, you know, that you'll keep going after it, going after it, and of course you have to love it, but loads of people love it. And in my case, I, my grandfather, when I was, I, I'm thinking about 10, I, I say that, 10, 11, he made an offer to all of his grandkids that the first one to learn Maple Leaf Rag, which was the famous Scott Joplin tune, would get $50. And I have since looked that up because it occurred to me what, how much that really was. And in today's dollars, that's almost $400. There's and a lot of bread, yeah. A wealthy man. He okay. worked for the post office. Okay. And so he, this was a grand gesture he never thought would, would, that he'd have to follow through with. And I lived in California, and all my cousins were in Illinois where my grandfather was, and none of them were making any progress with their piano lessons, which makes it especially funny, so he felt safe making this. And then, of course, I was out in California thinking about $50, and I learned <laughs> the tune. <laughs> and he gave me the money, and it was... And it launched me into, I mean, the best part of it, besides the money, was, well, my joke is that that makes me the only musician in history who went into it for the money. So, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, but the best part of it is that it made me very enthusiastic about this style of music, which I loved ragtime. It was fun to play, and it had, you know, it's very dense, the harmonies and everything. There was a lot going on polyrhythms and everything that I loved, and I was already as a kid a big fan of 30s and 40s movies, musicals. I loved all the Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers things, and it wasn't until years later that I put it all together that I grew up watching those things on television. So in essence, I was like a person who grew up in the 30s and 40s because that was the mm -hmm. music I was obsessed with, mm -hmm. and then by the time 
I got my first gig when I was 19, my first professional gig, playing ragtime, someone came in with a Count Basie cassette, a cassette of Count Basie when he was Bill Basie with Benny Moten's band. And it was swing version of ragtime. That's how I heard it. And I already had those chops. And so then I listened to that cassette over and over and taught myself how to play like that. So it's really from from that cassette that I did it all by ear, teaching myself how to play stride piano. So that's what launched me. Amazing, amazing. And there's another part to the story, which is that when your, when your granddad made this offer, you went to your music teacher for help <laughs> in learning this piece. So this is, a, this is another part of, of the equation, I, I believe, in, in, in making it. And, and tell us what happened when you went to your music well, teacher. Well, she said I wasn't good enough. And I think you're right in this. She said you're not good enough. And, and there's, there's many stories about fabulous talents that the early people say you're not good enough and they keep doing it. And she said, you're not good enough to play this tune. And I said, well, will you help me learn it? I really want to learn it. And she kept being negative, but she said, okay, if you really want to, but you're going to have to really work. So I did. And as soon as I learned the tune, I got my $50 and I quit taking piano lessons. <laughs> 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 and figured I could do this on my own. I've learned enough to launch myself, and she was pretty negative. And, I mean, of course, everybody tells me their horror, their horror stories about bad teachers, so I'm not unique in this experience, but the difference is that I found a kind of music I like. Speaking of music we like, let's listen to something from your new album, Judy. This is Boysdale Blues from your album Come and Get It.
all the time, how can I motivate my child to play, to practice? And I always say great technique, learning theory, all these things are really important and a great advantage, but make sure a big part of their lessons is a is about learning music that they're passionate about. Take them to live music. Expose them to everything. Find out what they love. Because I wasn't enthusiastic about my piano lessons until I heard someone play some ragtime. And then my grandfather requested that I learn this ragtime. And I thought, oh, I really like this music. And then when I heard Count Basie, I, of course, went nuts. But I liked ragtime and then was passionate about jazz and then it just went from there and I think that's it because that's what motivated me then finally I wanted to play because I wanted to play like that you know I heard something I really mm -hmm. wanted to do mm -hmm. you did an interview I believe it was with the son of a famous New Orleans drummer and I'm looking on your your vast list of people you've interviewed over the Who years is that? Gerald French Gerald French oh my oh. gosh he was oh well yeah I've done so many of these things I hate to say I don't always remember everybody yep. But what a sweetheart he is. That was, did you listen to that interview? Oh, I did, I did. And, and I believe it was him, I think it was him, that was talking about why is it that New Orleans births so many amazing musicians. Mm. And it really is, I think, the attitude the city has about music and all the different musical families down there. And I believe he was part of a musical family. And he said the key is let, you know, expose them to a lot. And let them play, let them have fun with it, and don't force too much of it on them. Right. And, and that, I think that it's a fine line. Obviously, have, you, know, you have to play, you have to practice, but too much forcing can, can separate somebody from their love of music, I believe. Oh, I completely uh, agree. And I ask people about this all the time because most of the great jazz musicians, that, well, I'll say all of them because jazz is not the popular music, so it's not on the radio. It's, it's all about exposure and finding it. And since what I talk about on my show is what inspired, you know, it's called Jazz Inspired, so it's all about right. inspiration, I'm always asking people, well, when did you first hear jazz? And it's always it. Well, my uncle was a jazz fan, or my father, or my mother, or some, somebody had to introduce them. And what makes it different in not just New Orleans, it's all over Louisiana, it is a definitely a cultural thing that music is not just on the side it's essential and they're proud mm. of it and they're proud that that's part of who they are and so from a very young age everybody is being exposed to music because there's festivals everywhere there's dance places i remember one of my first trips to, to louisiana and it was not new orleans it was in another little town and Somebody took me to a dance club, and they had Cajun music and jazz and all different things. And this 10-year-old boy came up and asked me to dance. <laughs> and it was fantastic, because that was not at all weird. I mean, all these people were there with their families, and I said, well, I don't really know how to dance to this kind of music. He said, I'll teach you. <laughs> and the fact that a 10-year-old boy would mm -hmm. be confident enough to come ask someone his mother's age... Mm -hmm. To dance was just delightful to me because it was mm -hmm. all about having fun. It was all, we're all in this together. Everybody was dancing. Guys were dancing with guys. Girls were dancing with girls. Old people were dancing with young people. But it is, it's the, it's the music is all about fun and the celebration and nothing is forced on you. So I think it, it, they, I think you're absolutely right. It's all the exposure of it. So of course you're going to get a lot of people who play. It's just part of who they are. There's a beautiful movie. I don't, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to see it. It hasn't had extreme distribution, but it's called Tradition is a Temple. No, it, I don't know it. I'm going to write uh, it down. It, it's really worth seeing. It was written and produced by a young man named Darren Hoffman, who was in New Orleans for an extended period of time. And he was a musician he, in Florida, and then he moved to, to New Orleans, and he just noticed the completely different environment between what he experienced in suburban Florida and what he experienced in New Orleans. And there's a beautiful segment where, and I'm looking up this guy's name and I can't find it, but, I oh know, Lucien Barberin, who I believe... Oh, I know that name. And it's Tradition it's, is a, what's the name of it again? Tr yeah, Tradition is a Temple. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah, and Lucien is a uh, trombone player. 
and he's sitting there with his granddaughter who is playing who's I think four right playing playing a tuba now she's not playing virtuosically obviously but she's in the rhythm and she's hitting some right notes and it just was it's such a warming warming beautiful thing and i think that's the spirit that the young people should be introduced to in music not necessarily the the distant teacher who's you know flogging them to learn <laughs> Well, and also, but in its live music, something I point out, and I even pointed this out to my brother, of all people. I mean, when his, when my niece and nephew were young, and he was saying, well, how can I get him to practice? And I said, well, when's the last time you took him out to hear something? Mm-hmm. And I, they are, they're in California, so they're not hearing me all the time. And he hadn't. And it wasn't part of their their thing to go hear concerts. And if you figure if people don't go hear live music, and there's plenty of live music that isn't expensive. People will say, mm-hmm. oh, it costs too much, but you can go to rehearsals, children's concerts. There's things that are a lot less money that you can go to. And people can take them to live music because what I always point out is that that a child might, ha- might have a great teacher, but they, they're probably not a great performer so that means that possibly the greatest person live that they'll ever hear is their teacher. Mm. And that's a lot different than going to hear a concert artist that's at mm-hmm. such a high level that mm-hmm. the kid's really going to be inspired not to be a professional musician. They don't have to be a professional musician, but they hear what this is like. And I remember mm. for myself, the first time I heard somebody was really great at playing, I thought, oh my gosh, that's what the music is supposed to sound like? Mm-hmm. That's very, very exciting. And I think that just reinforces that. I think everybody should go out and hear live music. And also in a smaller setting where it isn't just, and I love Billy Joel, but it isn't just hear, hearing Billy Joel at the garden. It's nice to hear somebody, if there's only 100 people with you that are listening to it or something like that, where you can get close. So I, I agree. I think that's essential. I'm going to um, continue on this thread of, of New Orleans because it plays close to my heart. And I do think it's – every city has great music. I, I think New Orleans has a very unique music culture. And you've done such a great job of interviewing New Orleans musicians. Uh, I think sometimes they don't get adequate or fair representation in the, in the media. Mm. Now, part, part of that has to do with the fact that a lot of them don't want to ever leave New Orleans. They, they don't you know, go on tour. They're not on the road 100 or 200 days a year. They stay home. But mm-hmm. that doesn't mean they're not great. So you've interviewed in no special order here, Tom mm-hmm. McDermott, John Boutte, Don Vappi, Alan Toussaint, Shannon Powell, and Herlin Riley in one interview. Yeah, which I was know, amazing. that was pretty incredible. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that, 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 was a, that was in Switzerland. That, that, it was in uh, Switzerland, festival. so it was on stage. And Shannon Powell kept getting up and dancing, and I kept, I mean, now we did have an audience, but it was really funny, because I had to keep chasing him with a microphone, because it's a radio show, mm-hmm. <laughs> so he'd start mm-hmm. dancing away from the mic, and mm-hmm. I keep having to tell him, you know, I'm recording this for radio, get over here, and sit down, and it was very funny, they were, I was like herding cats, but yes, oh. I've had a lot of New Orleans musicians. A lot of yeah, Gerald, Gerald French I think and, that it's and, a couple of things. They, how do I want to say this? The very thing that they enjoy that has promoted them and that has been helpful for them in some ways also puts them in a narrow direction because when people think of New Orleans, it's not just the music. It's really an effective brand at this point. It's mm-hmm. that they're all thinking fun, drinking, partying, street marches. So that's what will happen. These, they'll, it, it's a whole thing. And these guys will get swept up in it. And you and I know the individual musicians, but maybe to the populace, they might not even know who the best of these people are. Mm-hmm. And they get kind of in that narrow bag. So they get hired for a lot of things where it is about we're going to have New Orleans night. And Mm -hmm. on one hand, that will get them certain gigs. And on the other hand, they might, as I say, it turns into almost a cliche, and they might not get hired in some other places just for who they are as a musician. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? 
It makes perfect sense. It's a double-edged sword. Yeah, I think uh, that's kind um, of what happens with some of these people. And some of them do really like Tom McDermott, who's a fabulous pianist, but he has really, and by his own admission, branded himself that way, that he is as much a scholar as he is a pianist. He really knows his music, and he's as happy sitting in his house researching some long dead composer that he's dug up and found their music Mm -hmm. and it's really obscure as he is going out and playing in front of an audience i mean he really is equal parts scholar and pianist and fabulous at both and that will you know so people have to really be into that they may want to hear i got rhythm and tom really wants to play I can't even think of something that's something that's really, really obscure. And yep. that will limit your audience sometimes, too. You know, yep. I think that, that that will happen with some of these people. But and he's doing a vi- some- Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, he's, he's doing a very interesting thing now, which came out on your show, which is he's got a pretty good-sized house. Okay, with so enough, he's doing with enough- concerts there, right. Yeah, which I think is a great thing to offer the public and also great for the artist too. You have, you have your own venue and people coming through town know that if they want to hear Tom live and have that whole experience, they can do it. I, the reason I put so much emphasis on New Orleans is I didn't get to New Orleans myself until after, I call it the, the federal flood, don't call it Katrina, for, right. for, various, for various reasons. Yeah. I was really involved was really involved with levies.org so I never I never just say Katrina but Katrina is useful shorthand so I didn't get there till afterwards and I did go every winter for a couple of months for oh god oh six through oh through, through ten and I got to get really deep into the city and I had having been a lifelong jazz fan I was embarrassed and how ignorant I was about the riches of this this city so uh, I never miss an opportunity to tell people if you're a jazz fan You've got to get to New Orleans at least once. And yeah, I, well, and yeah. I think you don't even have to be a hardcore jazz fan. I think mm-hmm. that, that their musical culture, or their culture around music, is just such a beautiful thing to experience. And, in fact, I tell people about the French Quarter Festival, which, mm-hmm. now I've never been to Jazz Fest, but... That everybody seems to know Jazz Fest because it's gigantic and it has all different kinds of music and it goes off into rock music and all of this. But the French Quarter Festival is a much smaller festival that the locals really love. And that's where there's lots of music actually in the streets. You're right there in New Orleans in a, in a big way and you don't have quite the crowds. And that's in April. I think it's the third week in April, something like that. You'd know since you live there. But mm-hmm. I think I think it's great. So I think anybody would enjoy it. Just and you know, people always think, "Oh, I'm going to go to Mardi Gras," but I would much rather <laughs> go to the French Quarter Festival when there's fewer people, and you can actually you're not running from crowds. <laughs> yeah, Mar- <laughs> you know, you can just enjoy yourself. Mardi Gras is is definitely something to to experience. However. <laughs> There's a lot of New Orleans that leave town when Mardi Gras comes around. Right, it, it's right. It's a good thing to experience once. Yeah, and it's definitely not the first thing to do. So I would, I think that's a really good recommendation you've given, which is if you're going to New Orleans, time it to be there during the French Quarter Fest. The shows are free. They're, they're yeah, outdoor. and let that be your introduction. Yeah, and you're you're way interestingly enough, you're way more likely to hear the local musicians at a French Quarter Fest oh, than you are at right. jazz fest which has turned into a pop festival to a large degree. Yeah, um, that's what I mean. That's very much what's happened to a lot of the jazz festivals, and people use the excuse, because I've talked to a lot of presenters about it, they use the excuse that, well, we have to do it to support it. But that's like any business, and I, I'm sure that if I went to Harvard Business School that I would know that there's a business term for this. But that's when you have a business, it becomes successful. Then it gets to a certain level that you have to hire more people and you have to decide how much more money do I have to make to make that next leap to hire all these people. And so you can decide, no, I'm not going to hire those people. I'm just going to work to my maximum with this amount of people. There's that change. And Mm -hmm. that's what I contend has happened to a lot of jazz festivals. They could be smaller and, and 
be made up of real jazz musicians. But I think a lot of the, and I'm sure people will yell at me for this and I don't care, that they would, I think it's the ego of the presenter. And mm-hmm. they think, no, I want this to be huge because they have to spend a lot more money to hire somebody like oh, Elton yeah. John and say he, it's a jazz festival. <laughs> it's yeah. not a jazz festival yeah. once you hire Elton John. And Elton John's great, that's nothing, yeah. but that's not a jazz festival anymore. I mean, do you agree? I look, I look at it as empire building. Exactly. Uh, and it reminds me, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to watch this TV show called The Profit, and Profit in the money sense, The Profit. Mm. And it's a guy that is, assists small businesses, and, and it's a really interesting show, especially if you have an interest in business. And very often, the businesses he helps are food businesses, and they're making something by hand in their own kitchen, and it's fantastic. And his advice is always, you got to get this out of the ki- out of the home kitchen into an industrial kitchen. You got to you got to water down the ingredients. <laughs> you got to right, you know, right, I mean? right, 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 right. And that is a de- you know that's a decision. Now, luckily, some festival producers have decided not to do that. I think, for example, of the Great Burks Festival. I don't know if you're right. aware of that. Yeah, they they are focused on the the music, and then others, of course, have gone to the the pop pop rock venue. Which brings us to, to this topic, which is your amazing radio show called Jazz Inspired. Now, it's, it's on NPR, mm-hmm. and, and it's on Sirius. Right, Saturdays and Sundays. Mm-hmm. Saturdays and Sundays, and people can also podcast it, which yes. I, I, I love. So, and you can, you can also go, if you don't have one of these iPhones, you can get it right off the computer just by going to Judy's site, and you can pick any one of the... I don't know how many have you done now. It's it's oh, a lot. Gosh, over three hundred. Okay. I'm in my eighteenth year. Wow, that's so, so I'm great. not even sure how many I've done. <laughs> this is my eighteenth year. Yeah, I did it before podcasts existed, oh, and exactly. when it was only on NPR. It's I'm an independent producer, which one of the the great things is because of that, I can do whatever I want. I choose the guests. I talk to creative artists who are inspired by jazz but aren't necessarily jazz musicians, which I, my, my thinking when I created this show was I thought, I, I believed that the great artists, the ones that I really admired, did this as something much more than a narcissistic exercise, that they really cared about putting something good into the world that they wanted to educate, they wanted to share, and if I could get through their firewall and get to some of these people, like a Robert Redford, you know, the really huge names, yep. get him sitting down and talking about his whole creative process, not just uh, the, his latest movie, that we'd have a, that he'd be delighted and thrilled to get to have a broad conversation about creativity, and I would use jazz as my entry point, and then mm-hmm. I could sort of sneak up on the other subject. It, it wouldn't just be, tell me about Sundance. It would be mm-hmm. talking about music and then see how that had influenced his other creativity. And with Renee Fleming, she's been asked every question there is about classical music, but I talked to her about being a jazz singer when she was in college. And mm-hmm. that was a much different interview because we wound up talking about how jazz had influenced her bel canto work. When would that ever come up in mm-hmm. an interview? So, and then I weave in the music around that to punctuate the conversation. And that was one of my goals. Then my other goals, and this really came from all my travel, because I'm on the road a couple hundred days a year, spent a lot of time in Europe and other countries. And it really was obvious to me, to my shame as an American, and I love being an American, but in America, it's become you're either famous or you're nothing. That really mm-hmm. is a lot of what it is. Mm-hmm. And I know in my parents' generation, when people were reading a lot, there were lots of people where authors were famous, playwrights were famous, musicians were famous, all of these. Now it's athletes and influencers and, you know, things like that. That's who's famous and pop musicians. And there are all of these fabulously accomplished creative artists that I know that would never get an hour on NPR. And Mm -hmm. I'm able to give them that just Mm -hmm. because they're great 
and they're doing something interesting. I don't care if they have a new CD out because half the people aren't even making CDs anymore. Mm -hmm. Because why would they? So it's that kind of thing because in other countries it isn't that way. You can just be celebrated because you're great at something. That still exists in other countries. It's it's going more what America's doing, but this thing about being famous that if you're almost in America it's like we don't trust our own taste. So unless someone's famous we don't they must not be good. And my show really flies in the face of that because I'm proud to say that I get just as many downloads on some British musician that no one here has even heard of, but they find the in, the interview interesting, as I do for Seth MacFarlane. Mm-hmm. That's really saying something. You know, mm-hmm. if you're taking somebody that's, that's a huge name, but people now know they can, they come to the show and they know it's going to be an interesting conversation. Uh, it, that's, that's one of the other great dimensions of your show, for sure. You're interviewing artists. And it's irrelevant whether it's Robert Redford or a pianist that maybe only jazz fans, diehard jazz fans know of. It does, right. you don't, it, the, 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 interview, the quality of the interview, the depth of it, the, just the interest that's generated by the conversation, there's no, there's no difference. So please, yeah. you're saying that, because that's my goal. I, I just got a beautiful email from a woman who listens to the show, and she said she's never really understood bass, double bass, mm-hmm. and how it mm-hmm. works and how it's played, and she just listened to my show with Mike Karn, who is a fabulous bass player, and he's with John Pizzarelli, but he'd never be featured on a show, even though he's a magnificent musician, because he's a sideman, primarily. Mm -hmm. You know, people Mm -hmm. know John Pizzarelli, but they're not necessarily going to know Mike Karn. But he's hilarious, number one, so he's a great interview. We're laughing throughout. He's very, very articulate, and he talked about how one plays the bass and the challenges of, of having to play other people's basses when you're traveling around the world and all of these things. And I learned a lot. But this woman was saying that she'll, always, she'll never listen to bass the same way. And that's really my goal. I'm hoping that the show is not only oral histories that I'm collecting, but that it's educational and that it – another of my, my fantasies was that if somebody listens to – a conversation with Billy Joel, and he's talking about that he thinks jazz musicians are the hippest people alive, then maybe people who didn't know they could like jazz but love Billy Joel, maybe they'll give it a chance. I mean, that's always mm-hmm. my hope. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you're, 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 you're doing it. You're really doing it. You Using that base example, one of the other great things that you're doing with these, these interviews is you talk shop to a degree with the musicians, but you do it in a way that's illuminating that, and that also brings non-musician listeners in. Because there's a lot of people that obviously they love the music, but they've never had an opportunity to have musical training. So they don't know theory and they don't know all the mechanics of music and the nomenclature. But somehow you're able to talk with fellow musicians about the making of the music that gives the listener insight into what's going on, you know, who, what's going on in the kitchen, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know, and I was actually thinking of this in, in terms of, of your series. Does the food taste better when you know where the ingredients came from, who grew them, what they went through to produce them, and, and how they were put together in the kitchen. It, it, I think it does. I think it's, you, you taste more, you think more, you give more of yourself to it because you know more. And I, and I love the way you, you talk with musicians. I think you're, you're doing such a great job to bring more people into the tent. Oh, uh, thank you. I, well, I think with any sophisticated art that – you can love it on first exposure, but the more you know, the more you love it because, because it's sophisticated. That's one of the things with pop, with a lot of pop music. You don't have to be, you don't have to know a lot to appreciate it, and it serves a purpose. It's like junk food. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't, it, you don't have to have a sophisticated palate to appreciate ice cream. It's right there. Mm-hmm. But, but, 
if you get the perfect mushroom to make in the perfect pasta that's homemade and the sauce, all the things you're talking about, you start appreciating these complex ingredients. And that's what we're talking about with jazz. You can appreciate it right on the surface, but the more you know and repeated listenings, the more you know what's going on, you are going to enjoy it more. And I'm afraid sometimes jazz, especially in the past, I think less so now, thanks largely to you and people like you, I think in the past jazz was sort of, you had to be hip, you had to be an, in, it was an inside thing, and if you didn't know all the, the, the stuff, then you really were a square, you know, I mean, they, all this language that was exclusionary, and one of the great things that your series does is it, it shows, it portrays jazz for what it really is, this huge cultural force. Now, whether or not people realize it or not, all of the music they listen to practically, there's, there are jazz musicians that have their hand in it. They may not be playing traditional jazz, but in the, in the studios, a lot of those guys, as you know, are jazz musicians. A lot of the people playing pop music, and pop music is its own art, of course, a lot of those, those pop musicians are jazz musicians on the side or revere jazz. Right, so, right. So, so really jazz is not this obscure niche hobby for insiders and everybody else is a square. It's, it's really this massive cultural force in our country and, and, and in our world. And, and again, your interviews bring that out. And I want to tell people, in addition to the great musicians that you interview, you also interview all these people from – you've interviewed Chevy Chase. You've interviewed mm-hmm. – E.L. Doctorow, you, you've interviewed Seth MacFarlane, who turns out to be a crooner. I had no idea. I, I, did, I didn't know. <laughs> well, and I uh, think because I do, they're in person, so different things can happen when you're right there with the people. I'm fortunate with that. I mean, it makes it a lot harder because of logistics and things. But, yeah, Seth MacFarlane, I had Roy Scheider on, which was we talked about acting and and jazz, and, and, all, and we didn't talk about Jaws, which he was thrilled about. <laughs> and Frank Gehry, which was fascinating, and F. Murray Abraham, who people will know from Homeland. And that was fun because we did that interview right before. We did it on stage. We sat there before. He, he was on Broadway that the night. So he was going to, we did it before the show opened. And so, you know, a lot of it's the atmosphere that I have these people in. I did Frank's, Frank Gehry's interview in his office in L.A., and so it, it's great. I just, just, one of my upcoming shows is Paula Poundstone, who uh. fans of NPR will know. I'm going to have David Sedaris, and so I love writers, and they're fascinating because some listen to music when they're writing, some don't. And I to come back to what you said about jazz and that people sometimes think you have to be this hipster, I call out a lot of jazz musicians who I think have hurt jazz by acting when they play that they can be kind of snobby and they don't reach out to the audience and it's sort of we are hipper than you. We have this, we're playing this complex music and, and we're not going to reach out. You have to come to us and I don't agree with that. I feel that I am, people are paying money to see me perform. And while I won't dumb down the music, I will still talk in the concerts, try to explain something about the music, do some, frame it in some way that brings them in, which I think you have to. And I'm glad if you feel my show is doing it because that's a goal that I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to make it more accessible. You're really, you're really hitting it. And, and if anybody doesn't know Judy's show, this is going to be a, today, this, listening to this interview is going to be a great new chapter in your life because. No, thank you. Like, thank no, you. Thank you. Thank like, you. It's called Jazz it's, Inspired. Yeah. You can go to jazzinspired.com and you can download the shows or stream them or go to any of the platforms that you go to to get your podcasts. Great. Hey, let's talk about another chapter in your life that fascinates me. You were once part of a golf foursome out in Southern California. Sarah Vaughn. Mm-hmm. Am I... Am I... Yeah, yeah. Sarah Vaughn, <laughs> Freddie Green, and Harold Jones. That was pretty heavy. <laughs> how, did that, how did that... I mean, that's mind-boggling to me. How did, yeah, how did that... Well, I how, talk about it. It's funny. It's, um, you mentioned that I have a memoir that I call Swinger, which is perfect for the golf angle. Swinger, a jazz girl's adventures from Hollywood to Harlem, because I grew up in California and then came back to New York. And I really owe that to Harold Jones, who your listeners will know. He's with Tony Bennett, has been with him for years. His first really big gig was, well, his first 
big gig is he was in the first group of jazz musicians who ever played at the White House. He did that with Paul Winter, Paul Winter's consort, if anybody remembers that. And then he went with the Count Basie Band, and then he was with Sarah Vaughan when I met him. Or right be- well, I met him right before he went with Sarah. And I had just started playing golf, and he knew I loved it. And he called me, and he said, you're going to drive up to this place up on just north of Los Angeles and meet me for golf. And it's going to be Sarah Vaughn and Freddie Green. And I, had, I, had, um, I knew Freddie not well, and I'd met Sarah, and, but didn't know her. And I was scared to death, and I didn't play golf wa- well at the time. <laughs> And he said, you know, are you going to turn this down? You get four hours of walking around with Sarah Vaughn and Freddie Green. And I said, nope, I'm coming. <laughs> and I did. And I, I, it was unbelievable, of course. And I played golf quite a few times with Freddie. That was the only time with Sarah. And, uh-huh. and I think still. <laughs> because I kept hacking away and didn't give up, she gave up after seven holes because she was so frustrated and she hadn't played in a long time. She hadn't played probably in years. And I just kept my head down, didn't talk, didn't complain, didn't make excuses, and I just kept striking the ball. And from that moment on, she treated me differently because then I saw her quite a few times. She always used my name, always you know, if I went to a performance, called me out, invited me over her house a few times. I wound up going on a trip, a very memorable trip to Hawaii with her, which I write about in the book. That's, that, I have to say, that was, that's a very funny chapter. And it was fun to write because I went on vacation with her to Hawaii. And that was one of the more surrealistic <laughs> adventures of my life and loads of fun. It was really, really great. And I'm very, very fortunate that I got to have that time with Sarah. She was a huge influence on me and a big supporter of my early career. I was really lucky with that. Well, let's talk about that early career because part of it involved playing yeah. at Disneyland. Yeah. Can you talk about that? And And I also found it amazing that – you were the only woman instrumentalist? I know, isn't that something? <laughs> that just boggles my mind, this huge enterprise. How could that be? I know. It, well, it was the 80s, and it, they just never never hired a woman instrumentalist. And it was only, I'll tell you, it was only writing this book that I really focused on that afresh because my my early career, I was always the only woman. So mm-hmm. I really didn't think about it. It was, I mean, it, I'm not being disingenuous. It was just, I was used to it. I was a warrior. I looked at myself as a warrior. When I walked on stage, it was okay. I have to be with the big boys. I'd take a deep breath and I'd walk out and that was it. And I had to be, I was all about being taken seriously because a lot of people didn't take me seriously when they met me because I was this thin California blonde and mm-hmm. uh, young and and it was a big compliment that that I when I would meet one of these musicians I'd go backstage and the biggest compliment I could get from one of them they were always older always men usually black is they I'd say hi I'm Judy Carmichael it's an honor to meet you and they'd say oh I know about you you're really serious and that mm. would always be what they'd say and what mm. that, what that meant was someone had told them don't let her looks put you off. She mm-hmm. is a jazz musician, you know, because I look mm-hmm. like a cheerleader. I, you know, mm-hmm. I was just happy, <laughs> upbeat, curly, blonde hair, and very young. And so I could look just like somebody's girlfriend. You know, how did I get backstage? And But these guys, you know, that was one of the great things, and one of the things I loved about jazz is you can't fake it, because I did some right. acting. And I always say... You know, when I left acting and went into jazz, I said, you know, no amount of good lighting can make you play better. <laughs> and no editing either. <laughs> no editing. I loved it. I absolutely adored it. So I either uh, played or I didn't. And once I played, the guys accepted me and protected me. I, I had tremendous support from musicians. I can People always would ask me in my early 
my early interviews, they'd say, well, what women supported you? Well, no women supported me in jazz because I didn't know any. It was right. but the men did. The men were great. If they were good musicians. Funnily enough, if they weren't very good musicians, they really didn't support me. Mm-hmm. But the great musicians, they all supported me and protected me. They really protected me. We just did an interview with Carol Bash, who did a documentary on Mary Lou Williams. Ah, uh, right. And- and part of Mary Lou Williams' story, of course, is being out in Kansas City, roughly your, at the time you were in the you know, same time of life as you were in Disneyland, mm. and you know she had to prove herself every night. The, the, oh yeah. There was no, there was no, and I'm sure the same with you. you. There was no coasting. There were no bad nights. I mean, you you had to deliver. Well, every... you still have to. I, I mean, I live in the Hamptons. Of course. Of course. And a saxophonist friend of mine told me, and this was about five years ago, and he had a singer say to him. And this is New York, where we all like to think we're terribly sophisticated. And she said, Judy Carmichael, she lives in the Hamptons, right? And he said, yeah. He goes, she's made it because she's married to a rich guy, right? (laughs) I mean, the fact that, which, P.S., I'm not, but (laughs) what a thing to say. And that's from a woman. Mm -hmm. So there's Mm -hmm. still this tremendous, I I don't even know what to say. There it is. (laughs) Well, we're seeing more and more, especially this in the last maybe 10, 20 years, because, uh, of course, there have always been women singers. There have been some women pianists. They don't always get the credit that they should have. They, sh- they should have gotten Mary Lou Williams as a classic example. But finally, we're starting to see a generation of young women playing saxophone and, and, and bass and, and guitar and, and all, these, you know, all these other instruments. But they have it very hard. I remember late, great Emily Rimler she was talking about, oh, I forget who it was, but she had some mentors and some supporters among the old great jazz guitar players. I'm just drawing a blank right, on the guy's name. Right, right, right. But, but he, she said, you notice the audience kind of changes a little bit when it's my turn to solo, and, and the guy said to her, yeah, it's like the Nuremberg Trials. In other words, you, you know, once this young woman, because she was very young, but she was very good, once it, once it was her time to play, all of a sudden everybody's waiting for her to, to flop, almost. You know, there was just well, more, there was more pressure. Well, I'll tell you something that I went through, and, and I have to say that, it's, that I have feelings about the way it's gone now because it's very different. But when I walked on stage the first time in New York, it was for a big festival and probably a 1,000 people. And I was 25. They gave me a big introduction. I'd just gotten a half-page feature in the Times. It was a big deal. And I was the new kid, the California Flash. And Mm -hmm. uh, Dick Hyman was there. He gave me a beautiful introduction. And I walked out. And I was wearing pants, um, you know, white pants. It was 85 degrees. And a top that was backless, like a halter top, but it didn't have belly showing. It just, you know, like be- it was a summer outfit. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I was completely covered, but my arms were bare and my back was a bit bare. Mm-hmm. And the audience, they all, Judy Carmichael, and they all cheered. And when I walked out, the audience stopped applauding. They stopped applauding. And it was devastating. Wow. And I took a deep breath. I, did, I was confused. And I walked over to the piano, and I started playing. And about 16 bars in, they all started applauding and cheering. And then I finished my part of the festival. It was about 20 minutes, which was the typical thing. And then they applauded so much, they all stood up, wouldn't stop applauding. They finally Dick came back out and said the next person was coming on, stop <laughs> applauding, all of this. So that really taught me a lesson. Now, I took that as, and it made me love New York, um, fair enough, I walked out, it was a shock, I was the only woman in the festival, I didn't look, quote, like a jazz musician, mm-hmm. I was playing stride mm-hmm. piano that was associated with big, fat, black men, right. okay, it right. was a visual shock, they right. stopped applauding, but once I played, they went crazy, so I thought, good, it's all about the work, and that's what I cared about. And from then on, I wore jackets, and I mm-hmm. didn't resent it. Men on mm-hmm. Wall Street wear suits, and I say mm-hmm. this to the women who will hear this. I did not resent it. They could say, I should wear whatever I want. No, I, it depends on what it's about. For me, it was about the music. So I always wore something very tasteful, but I thought, I'm not going to show a bunch of skin. I'm going to wear jackets. They're very mm-hmm. feminine and all that kind of thing. And I did that. Now, 
I'll wear dresses, I'll wear whatever I want because I'm older. It's mm-hmm, not a mm-hmm. 20-something mm-hmm, coming out mm-hmm. in this, in some sexy outfit that's going to distract everybody. And my point is I wanted to be taken seriously. People did take me seriously. It was about the music, and I wanted it to be about the music. Well, I have seen a huge shift because I see women musicians now that are dyeing their hair blue, that are wearing really sexy outfits. And I have to say, a lot of them don't play that great. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. But they get the gig because now it's swung the other way. We've got to have a cute girl in the band. And as long as she plays well enough, then we're going to hire her. Now, there's some women that are great musicians who also were beautiful. But you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying, and I'm not yeah. wrong. Yeah, yeah. And I resent it. I know the men resent it, and I wouldn't hire one of these. I had one of these people, and she's very well-known. She's very beautiful, and she's a good musician. She doesn't have to do with this other stuff. But I was in a festival, and she walked out on stage, and it was winter, and she was wearing this, you know, the summer dress that was tie-dyed, and I could never hire her as a side man, not because I'm a woman, but if a mm-hmm. guy came out in a polka dot jacket... <laughs> Right, right, right. I wouldn't hire him <laughs> right. because it would take away the focus of what my focus is about the music. Yep. And yep. I'm, I'm on a bit of a rant here because you're allowing it, but I, I'm saying that for the women out there. What do you want to present? If you want to be taken seriously by musicians and by people who count and by discriminating audience members, you don't have to dumb it down. You can look fabulous, but you don't have to do this other thing. There you go. It's it's a little bit like the the festival issue. You know, what's what's the focus? Is it to get as many people in the festival as possible, whether they're music lovers or not, just because of the show business aspect, or or is it to have a high quality experience? And it's, and I think it's the same thing with how someone presents themselves. Absolutely, uh, I think know. it's a, that's a it's a wonderful comparison. It's exactly the same and I think that we have to put that out there because I remember early in my career I was talking to the man the the executive director of the 92nd Street Y which for your listeners who don't know New York don't know Manhattan is a very prestigious really fabulous hall thousand seats and a few you know a few less than that and but but very very respected you can't rent the hall you have mm-hmm. to be presented there. Carnegie Hall, you can rent. You cannot <laughs> rent this place. So That's people right. in the business know this is a very important place. Well, it was a big thing for me that I, that was the first place that gave me a solo recital. And I was complaining because somebody who I'd rather not mention was making a good piano player, but he was making it in a real pop sense and getting a big reputation and selling more records than I was and all of this. And I said, oh, man, if I could just get that publicity, you know, I was envious. Right, And right. this was many, many years ago. And this, this executive director looked at me, not with disdain, but a little bit, and said, he's in a different business than you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that, that's, that's and that it. That's, yeah, yeah. We weren't going to talk about this anymore. Don't compare yourself to that. Thank you, Judy, for this time. I I knew that we were only going to be able to just scratch the surface. There's a lot (laughs) to talk about. Oh, it's so great. I really appreciate you having me on your show and and talking about all those things. I went on a bit of a rant, so thank you for letting me do that. I never get to do that. Well, we'll have to. I, I have to have you back to talk about Stride and maybe some of the more musical things. And I knew we couldn't cover it all in one hour, but thanks again, and we will connect again, and we'll get to part two. I would love to do that anytime. Thank you, and I love what you're doing. Your whole site is beautiful. Everyone should visit it. Well, if they're listening to this, they are visiting it. But it's, it's just fantastic, and we will stay in touch. Thank you so much for this. Oh, thanks for saying so. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, please share it. That's how we grow. And remember to subscribe to jazzonthetube.com, the Internet's largest collection of free, streamable, classic jazz videos. And we're going to go out with Deed I Do, a really cool piece written by Milt Jackson and Ray Charles with lyrics by Fred Rose and Walter Hirsch. 
And this is on Judy's album, Come and Get It. Do I want you? Oh, my, do I? Honey, indeed I do. Do I need you? Oh, my, do I, honey? Indeed I do. I'm glad that I'm the one who found you. That's why I'm always hanging around you. Do I love you? Oh, my, do I? Honey, deed I do. Did I? 